So you'll have to turn your um, camera on. You can do it yourself. Um, yeah, I hear, you, I hear you now. I see oh, you okay. now. I just, yeah, I was just uh, trying to get it all set up. Nice to meet you virtually. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go grab water really quick and I'll just be right back. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> How's it going? You have something you want to tell me? Really? <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm an, too old to be riding a bike. That's what I want to tell you. I still have some friends in Philly. Just let, just let me know. <laughs> Damn. This Girl, you got Jack. <laughs> oh, you got a bike okay, on. <laughs> this is, this is just, from a, this just from riding a bike? Riding a bike, falling off a bike, thank you, at speed. <laughs> okay, why would you fall off a bike? Not intentionally, I was trying to Did get you forget how to use the brakes? Left. No, that was the problem, there was somebody too close, I couldn't use them. There was a car right behind me, he wouldn't like slow down to stop for me. You got hit by a car? I didn't get hit by the car, I got my, I was trying to get in front of him to make a turn and he, I got my tire got caught in the track. So you legally stepped, drove in front of a car and you got hit. I didn't get hit. She was fighting with a gangster. That's what really happened. <laughs> you look like you got hit. I'm just saying. <laughs> my face lit across the ground. And my hands and my arms and. Did you, did you, have, did you have a helmet on? I did. Thank you. Thankfully. All right. Ah. Uh, How's it going? Uh, you know, it's all right. A bunch of stuff going on. Leah, Rodney. Thanks for about to start. Good to meet you, Christian. Rodney, nice to meet you, man. I hear you when you say we got a, a got a bunch going on. We have a plethora of issues. We're trying to problem solve through this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start live, okay? And I'm also going to switch the speaker view so then it only does who's talking, so it's a little bit like better that way okay so can we just before you go live yeah i'm waiting i'm waiting to press the button okay so can we like introduce you and can you kind of say what you do okay christian yeah and then kind of come up with questions or i don't know if there's anything that you think would be helpful or useful i know leah's uh very on board as well i see everything that you're posting so I'm sure she'll have, well, we'll all have a million questions. Uh, and in addition to anybody else. I mean, I'll lay out my expertise. If I don't know something, I, you know, you know me, I'll, I'll let mm -hmm. that go. That's yeah. okay. We don't expect you to know everything. Thank mm. you. <laughs> if you give me a week, I could probably find somebody, but you know. Wait, who's introducing him? Am I? Sure. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I mean, I have your about section pulled up, uh, pulled up here. It is very long. So, <laughs> gee, you can just mention Michigan and be done with it. Okay. We, don't need to be, we don't need to be spending time with that. If we need to convince people who I am, then, you know, we're, we're just in the wrong spot. So fair enough. Fair enough. It's just to make a, uh, an introduction, Christian Davenport, professor. Uh, Not at the Washington Post. Yeah. Yeah, not the Washington Post, uh, right. Christian Davenport. Um, I'm not live yet. Oh, okay. I'm working on the okay, so just give me So a would minute. you say you're a professor in uh, civil rights and or civil unrest, or what would you? I'd say human rights and contentious politics, and then someone could ask me what that means, and I can explain it. There you go. Okay, contentious politics. Yes. All right. Okay, we're good to go on live and everything. We Are we live? Awesome. All right, guys, we're going to get started here. Um, thank you all for joining. And if those of you are watching on Facebook Live, which I hope we're on Facebook Live, today we have a very interesting um, call. I think it's very, it's very, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's the right timing for this phone call. I'm glad we're having this. We have an expert um, he is a professor at the University of Michigan. He's an expert on human rights and contentious politics. He's written several books on these subjects. Uh, his name is Christian Davenport. 
and he's here to hopefully school us on um i this is this is like a subject that i know so little about personally just like why there's so much going on um civil rights wise in the world right now in the whole world i'm really excited to hear more about this so thank you for joining us christian uh, thank um, you for being here yeah so what does uh contentious politics mean and can you tell me um, a little more about that i guess yourself and your background oh sure um so um, there's kind of a division of sorts within political science. Um, there are those that study things that are institutionalized. Um, they're within the parameters of regular political kind of uh, enactments, and they largely are what we would consider activities that are kind of like right, uh, right appropriate, and just, and kind of uh, routinized. We're used to seeing them. We're used to seeing um, elections, we're used to seeing city council meetings, we're used to seeing them. Contentious politics are kind of those unconventional types of behaviors that are outside of the traditional institutionalized mechanisms of kind of governance and deciding kind of like who gets what, where, and why. Um, and there's always a threat or enactment of some degree of coercion and force involved. And so contentious politics involves uh, genocide is the most obvious, civil war, um, protests, protest policing, insurgency, counterinsurgency, revolution, counter-revolution, um, mm -hmm. everyday forms of resistance. Um, it's, a, it's a wide panoply of areas. Um, and I've been studying this since like um, 92 I came out and so um, I broadly specialize in contentious politics writ large in part because I think there's too many people that specialize in particular parts of it and they miss how it's connected. Or for, for example, if you studied like terrorism, um, which many people did after 9-11, they started st studying terrorism. If you study terrorism, but you don't study protests, you might miss like that there's the same exact people. They're engaging in a tactic over here and they're engaging in a tactic over here, but we're studying it separately, like it's a different phenomenon. Or if you study kind of interstate war and other people study policing, you'll miss the fact that it's the same exact people that are in the military that come out and they join the police department and then engage in behavior that are responding to, to police. So our, so it's a difficulty within political science that we can, and sociology, anthropology, all the social sciences that we break these things up in divisions and miss the intersection. So um, my area is more broadly encompassing. Very cool. Bring it so, all together. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you were just saying, just the example you gave with, with terrorism and protesting, you're saying they're very similar in a way. Uh, because I wouldn't, I hear that and so, I miss the connection. So, so fun, fundamentally, people engage in those activities that are attempting to communicate their problem with a situation mm -hmm. and address a particular grievance. Now, sometimes that tactic is we're going to go out in the street with some with some banners and say what's wrong, and sometimes you're going to blow something up. It's the same people, but they're going to select different tactics to do it. Um, and so, I very much will almost always talk about civilians, citizens, and people who challenge authority, as well as much as I will talk about a government and authority. So governments will simultaneously, they have a tactical repertoire. I could shoot you in the head in order to intimidate you to go away, or I can threaten your grandmother. So it's just like, um, think, of a, think of a mafia movie. My thing is, everybody knows what contentious politics is. It's just about context. If you think mm -hmm. of those things that happen in any, like in the, in the Sopranos, except make it an anti-dissident organization, or a challenging institution and the state, same, same activities happen. Torture, disappearances, I'm threatening your moms, I'm putting a wiretap on you, um, I eliminate, occasionally eliminate a neighborhood from the state side. From the challenger side, I occasionally blow up a bakery, I, I threaten somebody, I kid kidnap somebody. This is the types of behaviors that I study. Wow. Um. <laughs> I, I have so many thoughts about that. So like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I guess, can you talk about, like, I, I, I'm very curious to hear, like, your take on everything that's going on right now. Like, what, what's playing it the, the biggest part in, in like, how this, you know, obviously, it's been, it's been a series, it's something that's been building up for a long, long time. But like, you have any, you have any uh, thoughts and like, why, why did this just, how did this all just happen in the past two weeks? All of a sudden things came to this point and So um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of pop culture, so I, I, will, drive, I will grab a reference whenever I think it's necessary. Um, so Most Def has this song where he talks about um, 
kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. And then he goes, well, you know, there's a million straws underneath it. I mean, so just as you identified, this stuff's been going on for, for quite some time. I, I've known Steph for, for quite a while. Um, and we went to Clark University together. I remember driving back up to Clark one time with, uh, with my best friend and we stopped at a little, um, we stopped at a, a, a kind of a, a place to go to the bathroom and then we were pulling out and I realized I, f I left my wallet in the bathroom. So we turned back around and by the time we had made the turnaround to step back to um, kind of like go back to the bathroom, three cop cars pull out of no place. They pull out weapons and then they start asking people questions. They start asking me questions and I'm on the passenger side. Um, Weapons drawn, asking questions. And so I'm just like, I'm a, I'm a kid going back to school. I'm like, you know, what, what, what yeah. else could possibly be going on? So if you concatenate this off of N number of people throughout the population through a whole bunch of different circumstances that do not at all reek of criminality or anything, you add those up generationally. Um, and then we've had moments, right? You know, People that saw the Rodney King video, it's like, it's, it's hard to imagine there's a group of people that haven't seen that video, right? It's like, because it matters. I think a lot of the protesters, I feel like. Yeah, this is a, is a newbie. Don't they, even know, like they know who he is probably, but they, they don't involved or really. They're, they're not there. What, what <laughs> struck me though is like, we see the video or I, I like to say reasonable people see the video and they're just like, oh, he's getting his butt handed to him. I haven't gotten I haven't gotten language clearance, but um, but so he's getting he's getting wailed on. But if you look at the trial discussions of the beating, you had police experts that broke down tactical variations to show when Rodney King was threatening the police officers. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even see this. Now, one of my best friends is uh, David Klinger. He's at um, University of Missouri, St. Louis. He studies um, police violence. Dave can break down to you at any point in time what's going on. And, and when the police deviated from their training. It's, it's a fabulous resource to have him because I'll be like, I'm like, what the hell are they thinking? Um, there's the kid that's in the park. He's got, a, he's got a toy gun. Police pull up. They shoot him within seconds of stopping. I see this. I'm just like, okay, what kind of, what kind of jacked up policing is this? Dave's going, it's, it's a command responsibility issue. The police never should have gotten that close. And the minute they got that close and they questionably had someone with a weapon, that kid was already shot. But what should have happened is they should have stopped before, evaluate the situation from a distance, and then proceed. So he, he accused them of not following procedure. And so it was, it was interesting to kind of think about um, that dynamic in many respects, and also how we start to kind of like navigate these issues to think about them. But we have a history of violent police behavior, and unfortunately, snapshots of emotional resistance to it, 67. 91. Um, we have Ferguson. We have these moments where people kind of step forward and no real change being taken afterwards. No, no changing of, the, of the, the membership of these institutions. No changing of the mandate with regards to how they define discretion. I mean, there's just a, a bunch of issues that um, are kind of like at, that are really going on. No discussion of kind of like what role we'd like coercion and force to play within our society. And so things just bubbled over. And then basically a new generation kind of like gets used to the same experience and then they get frustrated because the older people are just like, yeah, that's just how it is. Yeah, okay, you know, if it's, if it's after 12, I'm not gonna go outside. I'm not going to, I'm not going to 7-Eleven. We mm -hmm. start to self-regulate. The younger people don't know that yet. They're so, so they're still out. So they're at the basketball court to get stopped again. They're going home and they're gonna get stopped again. They're gonna get pushed around. They're gonna get aggressively treated by somebody and then something's going to happen and it breaks out. And what's amazing is um, the Kerner Commission report, there's a bunch of systematic analyses. You could find NAACP reports from 1908, 1909 talking about police abuse. It's just like, this is not new. It's merely an issue of who's going to get frustrated about it and when are they going to explode. And normally it's some egregious activity that kicks people off just like with the, with the Floyd deaths. And so that's just a historical pattern. Now, why is it so large now? We've been sitting around, we've been sitting around our houses for, for a couple of months thinking about deprivation, inequality, yeah. impoverishment, how fragile our lives are, how close we are to basically eviction. I mean, there's just so many things that are just kind of like grinding at people. And then something like this happens. That is so egregious. And then I think that just kind of that just kind of exploded. That said, Sorry. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, my question is: so saying that, do you think uh, like media is what brought everybody together to make it exact to make it as big as it was? And, and again, every every occasion that you've spoken about or mentioned or you know that's happened that everybody knows about is equally as awful. 
as the Floyd instance. So no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. If, no, because I've never, I've not seen one police expert look at the cop on Floyd okay. uh, on, on Floyd's neck and be like, "Well, that's standard police procedure," and he was representing a threat. It's just like he's already on the ground, arms behind him. Even Garner has some conversation, right? He's like, "Well, he fought back a little." Um, it, it's hard to calibrate the violence, and so this con this this situation on the ground, already prostate, already weakened, already vulnerable. Why are you continuing to apply pressure? Now it's just like uh, so we've not had anything this unambiguous before, and it is, it's unfortunate that it took something where it's just like, okay, you know what? There's no question. Um, we could have the conversation. Well, what happened before the video? We do that all the time. We say, well, what what are we not seeing? This doesn't matter. It's like mm. person's on the ground. It's like you know, okay, yeah, um, yeah. There's really nothing. There's there's nothing that would justify that, and so that that hits a, an amazing chord, and it gets back to this issue of. Um, kind of what I was talking to Rodney about, um, um, you have a repertoire and a repertoire is everything that could possibly be done. And then you have a legitimate repertoire and that's everything that would be done that could be deemed to be just, right and appropriate. And the minute you do something that is not part of that general category of acceptability, then people are gonna go buck wild about uh, how, the illegitimacy of the activities. But frankly, we live in an age where you need stuff to be as clear as freaking possible because there is no there is no ability to handle nuance. So it needed to be as clear as this. And the same with the beating of the protesters that happens afterwards. It's like, um, she's just standing there. Or the picture of like the 75 year old man that just got leveled. He just got pushed down. It's like, hmm. okay, you know what? I can't imagine what this dude would have done that would allow the police to do that and have people see that as being legitimate unless there's always, a, there's always a possibility. Unless that 75 year old man was cocking a weapon and just about to put it to the cop's face. Then you could be like, okay, I could see that. So there's always a circumstance where it's deemed to be legitimate, except this Floyd thing. It's like, there's, it's like okay, whatever led to that, nah, he's already done. Hmm. So you have any thought on how, like what, what amazed me about um, the past couple of weeks is like how suddenly and on a large scale it happened. Like, I, you know, like just being as down as downtown of Rittenhouse, the set when it started uh, with the last Saturday, the Saturday before last. And it was just, I, I, I never even heard it, it anything coming. So I, that was what, as one of the big shockers through me, like, oh my God. And then, and then you look and I'm like, oh my God, this is every city. Um, and so do you have any thoughts on how that happened? Like, there's two different takes on it, right? Um, so, um, when Martin Luther King was um, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, protests were huge. Um, by that time, the civil rights movement had more or less been devastated, and everybody kind of went home. They're just like, "Yeah, we got what we wanted: Civil and Voting Rights Act. We're good to go." Those were huge, and that's just because so many people had a connection to King that they were just mm -hmm. kind of ready to come out. And you know, if you look at what the uprisings were involving, it's not really too much. No one was being asked to kind of like go up and stand up in front of police and let themselves be spat upon or hit or cursed at, no one was, the, so the ask is really, t is really low on this one. That would explain why you have so many people. There's no training involved for what these folks had to do. You just had to show up. Um, and so that I think accounts for the large number. Um, it, also, it also belies this whole point of um, how much people support the political and economic system is never really tapped. We just presume that people are generally supportive of the political and economic system because they're not doing some stuff. This reveals that if you have an opportunity to go out and protest something and show up, that all those people that we thought were, might have been supportive, actually were not. What they were looking for was an opportunity to voice some complaint about what they deemed to be unjust or unacceptable. And so I think we generally tend to overestimate how much people are actually in support of things that are happening. It's like you give people the right kind of like motivation and context to be like, folks are showing up. So what shocks me or what I find um, powering. I wasn't surprised that black people um, generally initially were the ones responding and mm -hmm. kind of getting upset. That didn't, respond, that didn't, that didn't mm -hmm. surprise me at all. It surprised me that a bunch of other folks start showing up. It, it surprised me when a bunch of other folks step in between a police officer about to strike a black person. They step in between and say no. Now that embracing that, I mean, we have human shields and other kind of conflicts. Um, that, that phenomena is not um, that phenomenon is not new. In the States, however, that, that, that speaks to some, some new kind of phenomena when someone are not only gonna go, yeah, that's jacked up from a distance, 
when someone's going to step in between someone about to do some violence to another civilian, another human being, and be like, I'm not going to accept that. That for me is, that's what's different. That's, that's what I see as being that. And it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to take what's going to seem like a leap, but I'll, I'll try to bring it together. So we have people out that are uprisings, protests, and then we have these things called mutual aid organizations where people are just showing up for other people. They're collecting food. They're helping out their neighbors that are a little bit not, not as well off as them to go to CBS and grab some medicine. It's like, so we have mutual aid organizations. So that we have people showing up for other people in the context of just some basic survivability and in these highly contentious environments, that says to me that civil society is coming together in a way that it is not previously. And this is revealing to me that government is largely irrelevant to our existence. Hmm. So they're not feeding, they're not clothing, they're not taking care of our basic needs. Okay, yeah, we got that. We can take care of that. And they're not physically protecting you. Now other neighbors are stepping up to do that. So it's like, I, I'm like, I come away from this moment. It's a, it's a weird space, right? Where you, you, we've had this cor coercive and forceful kind of behavior going on, I mean, for decades. Um, I will, I will I'll, you know, post slavery up for, you know, up to this time period is just like, and not just black folk. I'm like, I keep bringing in the labor movement has been horribly treated. There's a bunch of aggressive police behavior in this country, but um, the response, the overwhelming response of the civil society to come together, and it's also kind of pro probably related to Trump as well, has helped uh, prompt people to kind of be a little bit more politically motivated to be caring about one another. Um, seeing indifference and seeing hatred, I think he's kind of, he's in a sense bringing out the best in us. So. Sorry, well, I'm like, that, I, I, have, I have long answers to stuff. I'll, I'll do my best okay. to prove. It's very, no. I mean, it's very thought invoking. I don't, I don't want to hog the mic. I don't know if you have any questions, yeah. Steph. I do, uh, based on what you were just saying. Uh, so it's, it's twofold, two things, two, two different things that you've said. One was uh, the people who are protesting and looting are one and the same. No. It's, I thought that's what you'd said initially. No, what I was suggesting that an aggrieved population, that's people who are upset, will select from a variety of okay. different tactics. The okay. looting thing specifically. Um, so like I got, I got asked to do a bunch of stuff in, in these what I call looting articles. That became the thing that the people wanted to talk about. And, and my, my comment to them was the following. These groups are heterogeneous. People that show up in the street show up for a variety of different reasons. Some people show up for injustice. Some people show up to get a date. Some people show up to get a, to an iPad. It's just like, it's just a heterogeneous population, similar to people who go to war. People go to war for many different reasons. Some to fight for their country, some because they want to kill somebody. It's like, you know, there's like, there's like, uh, there's a variety of reasons. So, so I've, I've seen no evidence. And um, there's some data I have from 68 to 72 that looks at um, about um, 5,000 uprisings and disturbances and about 5.6 of them involve looting. So looting is not a normal kind of like phenomena. And in the current context, we have some people looting, but I've seen no evidence that the people looting are the same people that were protesting. It's just like, they're just divergent populations, which suggests it's a heterogeneous population. We keep aggregating them. We say, we say protesters like it's one thing, like everybody in the, that's co-present in the space are there for the same purposes. I'm just like, okay, if this thing is disorganized, which everyone agrees, then that means there's no organizational dynamic behind it, which means there's no ID cards, there's no training, there's no socialization. So you can't hold everybody to the same account. Unlike the police, the police have a clear chain of command, the hierarchical dynamic. We, we know that you know, there's the police chief and it goes down from there. They have chain of command disorganized protest or uprising in, uh, dynamics don't have leadership. They don't have organizational structure. So you can't hold them accountable in the same exact manner. So yeah, I, I put protesting and looting in two separate bins, but I think they're both responses to um, inequality and persecution. But I'm like, you know, people who are well-fed and well-paid and respected don't loot. That's just, just, that's just kind of how it goes. Although interesting, because you've seen some articles where people look like they are all of those things and have been walking in or walk, you see them walking out of stores with goods. And I don't know if that's media planted, if they're not real or. If yeah, so that's that, that introduces something else. Right. So um, I've not seen this brought into the kind of like popular discussion, but um, amongst the repertoire of activities that police can do, they have front organizations they have informants and they have agents provocateur. An agents provocateur is someone that you have that looks like a protester that engages in violent or egregious behavior to justify state action against them. So until I have some background information on who the looters were, I'm mm -hmm. not, I, I just don't run with that. Right, which, which then feeds with, oh, it's Antifa. I mean, and so 
what became interesting for me was, um, but this is old school, when, when black folk or labor organizations were trying to kind of like mobilize, the local employer or the state would be like, it's those damn communists from the North. Now, was it always those damn communists from the North? No. So, yeah. Hmm. So I have a quick question. Um, how, um, cause you were mentioning that you, you had some uh, studies from, I think you said 68 to 72 about a bunch of disturbances and all that. Like, what do you, I guess that I have a lot of thoughts about that, but um, what, what we're seeing now, like how much of this do you think is going to be lasting change? Like we, you, you mentioned, we, we're seeing more than what, same, like more than what I expected to see um, with people supporting each other, not just, you know, and not just from afar, I guess is how you said it. Like how, what needs to happen or maybe from some of the other things you've seen in the past, like how does this turn into, it's a very broad question, but like something that's lasting, like what's, what has to even change or what do you think this is shit? some of the things that maybe you're seeing that are changing? You're like, people are talking about defunding the police, which I didn't even know what the heck that meant. So I'm starting to read some things on Facebook yesterday. I'm like, I'm like I, my first, so I literally talked to, um, I don't know if you get, you know, Renee too, um, our locksmith. And he was like, he's like, yo man, you should go get a, you should go get a permit to carry. I'm not the type of person who would ever want to carry a gun, but that's, that was my knee jerk reaction. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go get a permit to carry because what if Philly shuts down the, like when, and what if someone breaks in my house? So like, I know I went off on a tangent there, but like, that's, what, that's, but, um, that's not, so basically I can speak like a little bit, if you don't mind, just to, like for a second, I'm funding the police. Since I, I did like, Lee, I'm, Lee, your sound is cutting out, uh, by the way. Oh, it is? How about now? Is it okay? Is that just for me? No. Oh, I heard no. it. Let me, let me, okay. let me mute. Um, so basic, uh, basically, with defunding the police, those three words can obviously sound very scary, but defunding the police means taking a lot of the funding that goes towards their uh, like operating accounts and stuff like that and putting it towards community resources to help people. You know, cops are often called in to deal with a lot of social issues. Like, for example, if you see a homeless person on your corner, they're called in. So what, what are they going to do? They're going to arrest them instead of giving them a citation. Meanwhile, we can develop better uh, resources. Um, so, you know, you can call somebody and that person can get help instead of criminalizing addiction and homelessness and poverty. So that's defunding the police. It's not getting rid of the police overnight. If someone's breaking into your house, you're still going to be able to, as far as my understanding, you're right. still going to be able to call someone to help you. But in those specific situations of something a little bit more close to social work, they could just, um, you know, just provide more resources for the community um, instead of, you know, criminalizing all of these things that can be handled in a much better way. And we could avoid a lot of the tragedies that are going on, um, you know, because- Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes more sense because that was a, I had a knee-jerk reaction. I was like, oh my God, all right, I got to get it. I had the same thing. I was like, oh my God, they're going to, you know, what if they take all the money away? But again, like literally just reading one article, I was like, oh, I, I read a Washington Post article that's uh, defunding the police, question mark. What does that really mean? And um, and I read other articles after that. And uh, it, it makes a lot of sense when you look at the numbers and you look at actually, you know, what's going on. Okay. But actually, Rodney, let, let, let's take your knee-jerk response, man, because I think that's that's where most people are. I I would challenge, I'm just like, you know, where did you get that from? Where, where, do, where does that connection come from with police and order when many, many folk, especially people of color and poor folk, think of police not with order, but with pred predation and violence, mm -hmm. right? The second thing is kind of the following. It's like, um, so... Human, this is this is from Jim Scott. This is not me. He's a po political scientist at Yale who's um, who's been really profoundly, I think, important for a variety of insights. For a hundred thousand years or so, human beings existed without nation states. Most of the time we've been on the planet, have, nation states have not been around. When nation states came around, their their reach was very limited initially. It's only in the last couple of hundred years where states have had the coercive, enforceful, and administrative capacity to basically subdue and keep large amounts of people in check. So what, what, the, what the world would look like if there's no police, if there's no centralized, coercive, and forceful institution is what human civilization is generally looking like. They've made 
somehow what is abnormal look normal. And early nation states were, were not nice places. They, hmm. We were captured, captured human beings to work for extractive purposes. I mean, like literally like the matrix. It's just like, okay, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why that, that land never sounded so long. What's interesting though is, so defund the police has got to be, it's, it's a horrible marketing mechanism when all it is, is as Leah was suggesting, it's a reprioritization. Now, I think if you were to ask most Americans, it's just like, okay, what are the, what are the things you care most about? You got security, education, healthcare, maybe meaningful work, some entertainment. You're like, okay, so, so what do you think, what do you think the US government with your money, what do you think we should spend it on? A question that is never asked to us, but I don't think that most people would be like, let's take 50% and give it to security. So part of what I don't like about the defund discussion is it's like, let's talk about our priorities. Why don't we talk about our priorities? Because priorities are generally not going to come down to that. Except think of, think of the automatic connection that we make between no coercive or forceful presence and anarchy. It's just like, okay, look, it's like, okay, if I don't see a cop, then someone's going to crack me upside my head with a lead pipe and take my cash. Most of the time you don't see a cop. So what's keep people in check? The fear that a cop's gonna roll around or some basic human connection. Biologically, we are genetically predisposed against violence towards one another. There's a small percentage of the population. This, is, this also is not my work, this is some other people. But there's a small percentage of the population, they will jack you up and they don't care. And those are the people we generally want fighting for us and, and out in the streets doing horrible stuff because they like it. They're sociopaths with a badge or in a uniform, but you want these sociopaths to be on your side. Are they generally walking around the population? No, most of us are just kind of like, well, I would, golden rule, I, I, I wouldn't want to be jacked up, so I'm not gonna jack up anybody. Why would you jack up anybody, especially if you're, if you're okay, right? So I think we need to, to change defunding to make it seem like a conversation about priorities, which sounds a heck of a lot better, but I'm, I'm more on the abolition side, I'll be clear. I'm just like, um, I study coercion and force because I am a peace scholar. I'm one who believes in human rights. And I don't think that centralized, coercive, and forceful power is, has been a good thing on the planet. So I always made the connection. I'm just like, well, why are we just talking about priorities with regards to the police? Let's talk about priorities with regards to the military. We have 800 military bases around the world. Why? When, right. you, look at what, when you look at what they do and what happens around them, it's not really good for human beings. And so I'm like, okay, if we really want to push the priorities thing, let's push the priorities thing. And so, but no one wants to embed the police into what role are they supposed to play in society? What role are they playing in society? And what other coercive and forceful mechanisms are being used in the society? And do we want that kind of society? I'm like, talk about something I would love to have an open conversation about and just have everyone ask, answer that question. Because I, I think most people would be like, no, I don't think I'd like to live in a society based on coercion and force. That said, there's like 40% of Americans that believe that the sun revolves around the earth. So let's not get carried away at the level at which this educate the, the level at which this conversation could happen when we have that basic fundamental understanding of the universe misunderstood. And this is consist this is a question that's used in public opinion polls, which is kind of like, oh, let's let's have a knowledge question in there. It's like 40% of the population. Dang it. What do you do with that? So how, uh, we have, how we have intelligent conversation about defunding when we think that's up. I'm like, so, you know, we need to do it within parameters. But the, um, but the, the broader question that Ronnie asked is like, so I'm caught on this one, right? I'm just like, there's the hopeful part of me, uh, the one that's ready to get up every morning and the one that's ready to participate in any kind of conversation about, you know, what's going on. There's that hopeful person. And, and, and I like to believe that there'd be change, but I believe there'd be change after Ferguson, I believe there'd be change after 91. I believe they'd be change every freaking year of my existence. And I'd like to say that I'm shocked every time that I find out about some other police abuse, but I'm not, because I know how entrenched it is. Um, so defunding and abolition are better in the sense that they raise important questions. Something else that I don't hear people mention, people talk about abolition of prisons. Uh, people talk about abolition now of the police. But no one's talking about private police and no one's talking about 
private prisons. It's like, so even if you get rid of them, doesn't mean they're gone. You get private ones and private security, they're, they're not beholden to the state in the same manner. And so, right. it's, like, so it's like, what's that going to look like? Okay, so, so everybody's going to privatize. We're going to have another series of waves of gated communities coming up that are protected by, and then, and then what are we going to have? I mean, like, um, so, um, so it's a deeper conversation. Part of the difficulty with having this deeper conversation is first the, the problems of understanding the universe and how it functions. And then you can't do this tweeted. And there's no 140 characters. There's no series of 140 characters that lead you to have a better understanding of American political economy. Remember that? Remember the um, the big short where they're trying to get you to understand a really complex point, and so they gave you a beautiful woman in a bathtub to get your attention. I'm like, so. We, <laughs> but if, but if you do that for a whole movie, you're gonna lose people's attention. Could be like, when's she getting out of the tub? This is just stupid. Um, so that that's not gonna work. But basically, we need to communicate some very complex stuff to a group that is generally dumbed down to repeatedly about some stuff that might not be resolved in the, in the, in the short term. So like, yeah, initially you start talking defunding or abolition, people are just like, well, that, that's not really practical, is it? I'm just like, so is it practical to have your population repeatedly being killed off by public officials on a consistent basis? Is that, is that practical? So I'm like, it's like, you know, at a certain point, I'm glad I have a job that does not mandate that I have to be practical and feasible. I'm glad I don't have to think about what is possible. I, I like to think about what is necessary. I like to think about what we need to do in order to advance human civilization in a way that we think is more reasonable and peaceful. And I'm just like, who's not for peace? I'm like, even, even the most militant right wing fascist is just like, Hitler was for peace. It's, we didn't like his conception of peace, but yo, he wanted peace. He's like, yo, he wanted to get to a world where none of this stuff was necessary. Everybody wants to get to a world where none of this stuff is necessary. But what are we doing actually to get there? So it's like, I think we need to open up that conversation. And I, don't, I think we're bad with having conversations. Remember when um, there was a conversation for like, uh, it was under Clinton, John Hope Franklin ran it and they go around America and they, they convene a discussion about race. It wasn't racism, I think it was about race. And then they basically, the panel would talk for a while about problems in the city, generally why the thing was there. And then they finally go, they go to the floor and they, they, give, a, they, give, a, they give a 72 year old black man a microphone and, and say, you got a minute to discuss your problem with racism. Needless to say, that didn't work out too well because Homeboy had a lot to say. But mm. each of the locations got cut off and each of the locations, people got heated because they were just like, well, I can't speak. You don't want to hear me. So it's like people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear the details and they definitely don't want to hear rage. This is just like folks don't understand rage. And I'm just like, I, I get it. I, I, I get it way too well. And so... It's kind of, I, I was, I've been working on this blog, which is kind of like, um, I don't like how you protest your persecution. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I don't like how you protest your genocide. I'm just like, what kind, what kind, of, what kind of planet do we exist on? We're just like, okay, look, I know, you, I know you're subject to some horrible stuff, but here's the parameters within which you can legitimately protest that elimination. I'm like, and you don't think people might have some problems with that. So I'm like, uh, I don't know. Not, all, not that all bets are off, but I'm like, it, you're asking a lot for someone to exert some control with that kind of emotion and weight behind it. Um, so, so we have a question. So I just want to let everybody know, um, you can also ask questions in the little Zoom chat box because we do have a couple people on here. Um, and if you're not comfortable asking it just out in the open, just, you know, um, if you could privately message me on Zoom, you can see at the bottom, it says of the chat box, it says two and then everyone. So this question is in relation to the George Floyd incident. Um, so apparently when, during an arrest, when you have more than one officer, there's an officer that's in charge of arresting, like actually putting the cuffs on. And then there's an officer that's in charge of like, the, you know, you saw the cop that was standing there keeping people from um, actually, you know, interfering. So the question is, how do you think it, uh, what, how do you think of cop hierarchy? What would uh, you say about cop hierarchy in different precincts and about race hierarchy within the precinct? If you could answer that or have any knowledge on that. I would defer to my friend David Klinger on any type of police procedure. Um, so from, from my perspective, um, I need more information. So I'm kind of like, I don't understand the circumstances by which the police were, were brought to this particular location, what they were supposed to be handling, um, and how the local crowd was when they arrived. 
I acknowledge, however, that police arrival does come and does incite simultaneously. And thus it's possible that we'd not, we would not be in this situation at all had some people from social services rolled up and be like, hey, Mr. Floyd, what's up? Um, so there's, a, there's some video of some Swedish cops interacting with somebody on a, in a New York City um, uh, subway. And they're talking and laughing with the person. And you know, anybody who's been from New York, you know exactly how the police would handle this particular situation. And it doesn't involve... I do, don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and it does not involve any um it doesn't involve any laughter and it doesn't involve any comedy it's just like um the police escalate as much as they as as much as they de-escalate and we don't really know the particularities of that and so i'm like um so i'm sure dave will go to hierarchy i go i'm sure dave will go to training and he'd be like who should be controlling what but i'm like how do you get to knee on the neck i'm just like okay um I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of that scenario where knee on the neck gets there. And then the whole, dis, um, many people don't go there, but that they knew each other. So I'm just like, mm -hmm. um, okay, so forget everything else. But they, how does the one person that knew you end up with the knee on the neck and we're not exploring exactly what happened there? So I don't want to go there. I think many people don't want to go there because they're just like, let's deal with police citizen relationships. But I'm sitting there going, what's the chances of that? I'm like, <laughs> so you just happen to have, he, someone said to me, oh, they, maybe he didn't recognize him. I'm just like, not many, not many, unfortunately in America, there's not many white people that know that many black people. So like clearly from almost any angle, you know the one or two black people that you know. It's just like, and you happen to end up with a knee on the back of their neck. So I'm just like, I'm like, whatever. So um, I can't really speak to procedure, but I, I, as a human rights scholar, I'm hard pressed to think of a procedure that, um, I, I'm hard pressed to think of a scenario or a sequence of events that result in knee on the neck for that long that are deemed to be acceptable. Um, that don't get to some kind of emotional problem. Um, had Floyd just um, beaten the hell out of one of his colleagues, um, killed three other individuals, then I understand putting him down like that, cuffs behind the neck and then like uh, cuffs behind the back and knee on the back for a minute. But the minute it starts to go to that point, then we're in conversations. Remember after Abu Ghraib, we had these detailed conversations of stress positions. We had these detailed conversations about what is torture. That was torture. So I'm just like, um, you're, either protecting this, you're either protecting and serving the public or you're engaging in torture when deemed reasonable. I'm like, I thought we didn't engage in torture. So um, if, one, if one wants to go to technique and to kind of justification, I think they have to kind of go to that. There's no sequence that results in that being acceptable. I think should be our, our take. And maybe we can get Dave on a call for another. Yeah, I think I think Dave will be up for this. Cool. Get those questions answered. So uh, to your point earlier too, I think uh, I feel like you know part of what we're trying to do here is to a conversation and have those conversations um, and try to continue them, not have them like you know do this today and that's the end of it, um, and to continue and to keep the conversation going. Well, I'm definitely supportive of that in part because I think that Americans get sold on this, um, our, our participation ends when we voted. And I think that's just a very narrow way of thinking of our citizenship. It's a way, it's a, it's a narrow way of thinking of our humanity and our engagement. I, I think, unfortunately, politics is happening all the time. And so we'd like to think that we can go about our business and then we let some representative handle our stuff for us. But, you know, it's not like that. Um, if we're not going to check kind of some economic processes in the way that we're going to, that other countries do like Scandinavia, for example, if we're not going to check them, then we need to be a little bit more engaged to make sure stuff doesn't go off the rails. And I think for people just to be more aware of kind of what is going on so they can make those decisions or, you know, take them into consideration when they are voting. Um, but that gets to be complex, right? So, uh, the military budget for the United States really hasn't been significantly modified in like 40 or 50 years. That's across administrations. And so that, that belies a different type of problem, which is just like, well, how come people aren't fundamentally making these changes? And I'm like, for those of us who are a little bit older and grew up during the Cold War, when the Cold War ended, I would figure, hey, you know what? There's all, these, all this money can now be diverted to developing civil society and improving our education and making us a wonderful society, which is what I thought they were fighting for. It's like, mm, didn't really work out that way. 
um, the State Department, CIA, and a bunch of the National Security Agency came up with a bunch of new people we needed to fear. And then the money, the money just got moved to some other part of government that didn't come down to the population. So I'm just kind of like, wow, when, when were we going to see the benefits? And that industry is huge. You ever read any, if you ever see the video about the military industrial complex from Truman, it's just like, damn, powerful. Hmm. Do you have any practical advice on like, like you were just mentioning, like it shouldn't just end with, oh, I voted, I did my job. Like, what can we do just as individuals to, um, I don't know the right way to say it, just to stay, like this is, like Steph said, this is kind of our part. We want to keep the conversation going and just get more people educated about um, what's going on, what, you know, what's really going on, and what, the whys behind it, and like, what can we do? Because <clears throat> I really, you know, I personally, I just feel like I don't even know what to, I agree with a lot of this, this, this sentiment, but I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do right now? Like, so, I mean, what's interesting. So, so I'm on, a, on the, I'm on the other end of it. Right. So I spend the majority of my time with a bunch of people who specialize in distinct forms of conflict and violence to figure out what's going on so we can stop it. That's the people I'm hanging out with, or I'm interacting with human rights activists who are systematically trying to stop from some form of abuse. So these are so not the normal, ordinary civilian citizen that it's just like, um, but then you realize at a certain point, it's like, okay, so the stuff that I write academically is really for a couple of thousand people. They can basically follow the jargon and follow the stats. Um, and so now I became interested in like, so I'm doing graphic novels, I'm doing podcasts, I'm doing, I'm doing blogs, I'm trying to figure out ways to kind of reach, reach an audience. So I, I think there's a bunch of people in the academy who would be interested in trying to reach out. Um, but my you ask me, you say something like that, Ronnie, the first thing I'm gonna do is like, well, I could assemble a list of things that you could read, but like, who, who's got time to read some stuff, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think the next thing is, I could try to develop some kind of like um, citizen manual, which would then give exam. So there's a project, right, that lists 300 forms, 300 forms of behaviors that take place within democracies. Voting's one of them. There's 299 things that we don't really talk about. So I could like give you all lists of some stuff and we can kind of like talk through some stuff. That's fine. We can find experts on particular things that you think might be interesting. Um, but I think it might be that either the resource to answer your question doesn't exist yet and it needs to be co-created um, or it's out there and I don't know about it because it's speaking to a distinct audience that I'm not normally engaged with. I mean, so it's, um, so your question is, I think, maybe a call to action more so than anything else, like, oh, re download this link in this little video and that'll hook you up. I'm just like, mm -hmm. uh, cause I think of like, um, uh, faced with a similar conversation, I referred someone to the video in um, um, the Bowling for Columbine movie. Um, it's the cartoon that talks about the role of fear in America. Someone had asked me Bowling something. for Columbine? Yeah, if you do Bowling for Columbine cartoon, there's a, it's like a two minute cartoon where Michael Moore in his more reasonable moments lays out the role of fear in America and how we're motivated more by fear than we are by reason. It's brilliant. But that just captures like one, one aspect of the whole problem. I want like, uh, you know, remember um, um, Schoolhouse Rock? I'm just a bill. I'm like, many of us can still like, you know, we can still like almost give you half of that song. I can tell you what a bill is like now, how you get to a bill, um, that bills get reversed, that there's uh, the divisions of powers. Okay. So we need that for everything, right? It's like, okay, we need, we need something like that, which then suggests we need someone that's got a popular interest, someone that's got some graphical skills, someone that's mm -hmm. got the voice of, uh, <laughs> the voice of regular people there. Um, I mean, you know, so I think, um, your, your question is, is a call. I mean, I'm willing to, I'm ready to, I'm willing to put up some, some time to kind of like help to that effect. And, but I acknowledge that it's like, I'm like, and you know, that's how I started off. I'm just like, okay, look, um, that's probably going on. That's what I study. Um, mm. and, and the thing I do not like, I do not like when someone is asked about something that they don't know about. And rather than be like, oh, you know, you should talk to so-and-so at Arizona state, or you should talk to so-and-so at Tennessee. They'll be like, well, here's how it's going. I'm like, what do you know? you're a theologian. Why are you talking about economic policy? And so it's like, and then the, this, then the citizenry doesn't understand that this person isn't really qualified to talk about this stuff because they're on CNN or C-SPAN. And so that's just kind of like what's going on in the media. 
and now it's even more complex, right? Because everybody's a journalist and everybody's got a site and everybody could talk about some stuff. So that's not helping people navigate. Um, so I tend to be more evidence oriented. I tend to be more, um, I'm, I, de I defer to expertise generally. Occasionally I'd be like, mm, nah. <laughs> but, but every now and then. So I think I sent, I think I sent um, Steph this link to this guy, uh, Khalil Muhammad at um, the Kennedy School, Harvard. You did. It's like, I agree I with his that. analysis. We would, come, we would come at it differently. I'd use different examples. I use different types of data. Much of what he talks about, I'm like, okay, uh, maybe, maybe that was stated, but I think basically he's got it right. And so I'm just like, there's a couple people out there that are basically saying things that I think are historically correct and reasonable. Um, but there's just, we're not armed in a way to think about, I'm doing this with a friend of mine, Derek Darby. Um, um, we're not armed to think about how to evaluate the current situation regarding politics, economics, and social life. We're not taught to evaluate what we would like to see in the world regarding politics, economics, and social life. And without that last one, it's really hard to figure out what to do. So, you know, do I think the defunding or abolition is, is what we should be doing? That's in part a function of the world we'd like to live in. And if we're not having that conversation, then it's hard to make a conversation or some policy about what to do with the police. And in order to talk about what we'd like that world to look like, we need to talk about what the world looks like now, really, and what would be necessary to change it to get from one to the other. And the only like topic that fits that really is like comparative utop utopianism. And who the hell took that in school? Nobody, man. It's like- I don't even know what that means. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Utopia is basically, it's like, you know, it's this, it's like Octavia Butler, right? It's just like, it's futurist. It'd be like, this is what, this is one possible future, which is why I find the Afrofuturist to be so fascinating, like Parliament Funkadelic and Octavia Butler. You have a bunch of people who are just like, you know, this world is so jacked up. I'm going to spend the majority of my time thinking about the future. I don't want to deal with right now. I'd like to talk about 500 years from now. What's, the, what's stuff going to look like? And I'm like, once you start realizing that's what they're doing, you're like, damn. And then you start thinking about like, wow, how does that world be different? Like, you know, David Chappelle does the same thing sometimes too. He'd like, in his comedy, he'd be like, of the future world of like, oh, it looks like this. He'd be like, oh, okay, that's different. That's, or the, the Confederate States of America. You see that? It was just like, it's like, oh, um, um, the, the South won the Civil War. What would be different and what wouldn't be different in the US? I'm like, oh, damn, good idea. I mean, so these things like provoke conversations, I think in interesting ways. And that could be a way, that could be one way of addressing some of these points, right? It's just like, okay, Let's come at this in some offbeat way. I'm not gonna have you read some 300 page Nobel Prize winning book, even though it might be fabulous and accurate. Like my friend, um, Heather, Heather Ann Thompson, Blood in the Water, about the Attica Rebellion. <laughs> What's it called? Blood in the Water, phenomenal. You'll just be riveted, you'll read that thing from start to finish. Blood, B-U-D. Blood in the Water, yeah. Blood, 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 got it. And it's basically like, okay, so why were they protesting in the prison in the first place? Well, guess what? Because it was jacked up and violent. Um, how did the state decide that they were going to intervene? Mm, it wasn't really a clear, rational decision. Um, was the state guilty of uh, mass assassination and violence? Yes. Did they try to cover it up? Yes. It's like, damn, that's just one incident in one location that took her like 10 years to figure out. So I'm just like, there's no, there are no easy answers. I think if everybody's yeah. committed to, okay, you know what? We ain't gonna figure this out. What we can do is we can shed a little bit more light and try to make better and more reasonable evaluations and judgments of things that are taking place in the world and try to piece it together. Because part of my thing is I take about, I talk about um, the D marketplace of ideas. It's like, there's this guy, Charles Lindblom, he had this idea called the marketplace of ideas. And it's literally, it's like a marketplace. You go in, there's all types of ideas on the shelves. You're like, oh. I like to figure this out. Let me take these books. I like to figure this out. Let me take these books. The deep marketplace of ideas acknowledge that, well, the US government wasn't just sitting back and letting anybody say whatever they wanted to. They were rounding people up. They were kicking people out of the country. They were killing people. They were putting them in jail. What happens over time is people taking some books off the shelf and we never got those back. But my thing is my question, the thing I'm trying to figure out now is, what if the anarchists, anarcho-syndicalists, Luddites, socialists or communists actually had part of it right. What if part of their critiques were actually accurate about what should be done? But we eliminated them 
and no one really knows what they have to say anymore because we weren't taught those things because they were banned. We don't even know to look. For, we don't even know what to look for in the library. Be like, how to fix the world. I mean, like you don't even know who Google's who Google's anarchism. It's like in the library, not because because what you get on what you get on the internet is some 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 eighteen year olds in black, and that's not anarchism. And so it's like uh, where to start. So I, I think you all have like you have all, you all have done that, right? You've been like we'd like to start. Mm -hmm. there's something there's it's a long term project <laughs> yeah and so yeah so that's that's part that's partly it right you need folks that are um committed to a little bit of time to kind of expand and look at some things in some ways that they wouldn't necessarily do have some conversations that they wouldn't necessarily normally have and acknowledge that that's just part of what we need to do until we get to a position that's a little bit more reasonable okay and I think we've taken a lot of your time. <laughs> all, all good. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm hoping- It's one of those, it's Steph calls moments. Come on now, I, you know, there's no saying no to you. <laughs> You're relentless. So uh, I will be calling you again. Of course. More conversations. And uh, I'm really looking forward to continuing, you know, this conversation and just broadening and just, Whatever it does, you know, it can't, it's not going to hurt. And I think it would be helpful to have, to open it up for conversations for everybody. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll admit I have, I have an honesty suppression problem and I usually provide way too much information for folks. So <laughs> y'all can filter on your end, but I'll just shoot it out. So I wish we, I wish every bit more people were like that. We just want the straight truth. <laughs> yeah. With an unbiased, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll be clear with what my biases are generally, but um, I'll also try to provide a bunch of other information. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, we See appreciate you taking your time today. My pleasure. And thanks awesome. all you guys for joining. This call is going to be on our Facebook. Um, so if you guys just, you know, want to share with anybody or want to watch it again or anything, um, yeah. it's going to be on there forever. So, um, yeah. We're going to have to get Leah's mic fixed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Work on it. <laughs> Thanks right. so much. Thank okay. you. See you All right, guys. Catch you later. Bye.